welcome to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. As always, I'm your host, Chris Collins. We're back in studio. The legislative session is finished up. We had Steve Kulik on recently to talk about the House side today. Let's talk about the Senate side. Who better to have than the Senate President, Stan Rosenberg? Thank you. Welcome. And Happy to be here. Great to have you back. And before we get to what happened on Beacon Hill, and a lot happened on Beacon Hill this summer and spring, you just got back from a trip to Canada, which recently yes. got some press and uh, was it like a trade mission, that kind of a thing? We have an official relationship between the province of Quebec in Canada and Massachusetts. We're about 6.7 million people. There are about 8 million people. We're very similar uh, kinds of jurisdictions because we've got uh, a lot of higher education in both places. We both have a lot of agriculture, forestry, things of that nature. So we have a big trade relationship. So. Uh, a number of years ago, the parliamentarians in Quebec reached out and said, how about if we make a, uh, uh, what we call now a conference, that is Massachusetts legislators and Quebec parliamentarians, and we'll work together on things like transportation and energy and economic development and higher education and tourism promotion. And so uh, we held our third meeting uh, in uh, Quebec City and Montreal just this past month, and we are uh, well on our way to uh, a number of joint initiatives, the biggest being energy and transportation at this point. Let's talk about the energy thing because we were talking before the interview and you mentioned to me that a while back Canada made a decision, they had to make a choice between going with nuclear and going with hydro and they went with hydro and that generated a power surplus in that country? Now that's correct. It's actually in Quebec uh, province where they made that decision as opposed to the national Canadian government. And uh, they are now 98% of all of their electricity is provided by hydropower. And they have enough so that they can export to other provinces in Canada and into New England. And over the last mm, four or five years, we've had conversations going about maybe Massachusetts would uh, do uh, bulk buying, if you will, long-term contracts for electricity that is uh, uh, more green. You know, we've been big on solar and making great progress. We've been big on efficiency making progress, but we haven't made progress on hydro, offshore, or onshore wind. And so um, we just uh, got legislation onto the governor's desk. He filed it originally. We uh, tweaked it, and it's back on his desk, signed into law, and it allows for long-term contracts both for offshore wind and hydropower. The hydropower, uh, the largest possible provider in North America at this point would actually be uh, Quebec. And so we would expect them to compete for providing uh, green power to Massachusetts and New England. It's pretty exciting when you think about it. I mean, everybody talks about renewables, but you know, the number of rivers around here, you would think, I mean, I'm not sure why we didn't embrace hydropower around here. We quicker. do some Somewhere. small scale yeah. hydropower and there's provisions in our legislation in the last few years to encourage even more of that. but. The scale on which we have to replace the power that's coming offline, we discussed in our last show together. Uh, we've got almost 9,000 megawatts of power coming offline because plants are closing. These are coal and, f and fossil fuel driven plants and nuclear. So um, if we don't want a pipeline hmm. and we're going to get rid of, and we're getting rid of these polluting plants, we have to substitute with something. Yeah. And again, we're making progress on solar and efficiency, but it's not enough. So hydro and uh, wind are the next two frontiers for us. I guess the question and the concern is, I mean, and we'll talk about the moratorium a little bit with Berkshire Gas, is, you know, we're talking about the transition from fossil fuels to, to renewables. And the concern I've always had is, is the conversion time going to be quick enough? I mean, we keep hearing about the potential for renewables, but it's, you know, with the exception of a lot of the solar things we see, it's not really a mainstream large percentage of our pie? Totally fair question and concern. We have the ability to move much faster than we are willing to move. And uh, in fact, if you look at the energy debate that just occurred, uh, the Senate was much, much more aggressive. We wanted 4,000 megawatts right. of green power uh, to be contracted for in the very short near term and the uh, compromise was about 23 or 2400 megawatts, way short of where we need to be. Because as I just said, we got to replace 9,000, never mind the growth in energy demand. What's, what's been the whole, I mean, is, what's been the barrier? Has it been? It's the transition from a centrally managed, centrally controlled energy supply 
and a more decentralized and a uh, not only is it central but it's also built on fossil fuels and this system would be built on green energy and that green energy is more diffuse and more distributed and the utilities don't like having to you know do do a separate deal with every household that has solar on their roof or every business or whatever and so it's a transition between the way we look at it in the Senate it's we're looking at the transition between the old economy and the old centralized systems and the disruptive economy that's based on new technology whether it be computers and everything that's coming out through there from you know uh, from Uber and Lyft to Airbnb to gaming online versus in a physical facility a capital investment and all of those folks who are used to and who have a, who have control of the economy in the old systems are fighting the transition. Well, that's kind of where I was wondering is how how much of this is about the utility companies not a lot. Yeah, I, I figured and a lot. And that's that's unfortunately the problem with the system. I think is you know you get these companies, these big fat cat companies that throw a bunch of money to block progress, yeah. and and the the taxpayers, the citizens, are the ones that end up holding the bag. In the end. We can have a totally green energy future somewhere between ten and thirty years from now. We can be closer to 10 if we are really aggressive. We'll be closer to 30 at the pace we're now going. And this is a critical situation in terms of climate change and the environment, but it's also a critical situation in terms of the economy because we have the fifth highest rate, uh, electricity rates in the country. Our bills are average for the country. That said, we're doing such a good job that if, our, if we could lower our rate, our bills would be below yeah. average and it would help our economy and help our institutional and personal budgets. But get, making the transition occur and getting the people who control these centralized systems and have you know, control of the money and the resources now is extremely difficult. And um, it's very, very hard. The Senate has been out front in this for really a decade now and pushing very, very hard. And the bill that we sent to the House uh, on energy, uh, our, our energy future, uh, was so much more aggressive than either the governor or the House. So we're going to be back at it again in January because, frankly, we've hit the cap on part of solar again. And so, you know, we had that big to do for about, uh, whatever, maybe 16 months or something. Uh, we're going to be back at it again in January yeah, because we've yeah. hit the cap in part of solar. You're going to have to find a way to raise that cap. And raising caps is a, kind of a controversial subject these days when you talk about charter schools. <laughs> but but yes. this one, I think, makes sense to raise the cap. But we also need not only to raise the cap, but we need a permanent, I mean, we need a clear vision multi-year so we don't come back every six to 12 months and right. raise the cap. Because we set up a system of incentives to stimulate the creation of a solar industry. It's working. The market has to take it over, and we can't keep um, we can't keep uh, artificially um, boosting it by these incentives. I'm I'm missing the word I'm looking for. I know what but, you're saying, but it's it, it. We really need to phase them down, and we need to give people predictability of the rate at which it's going to be phased down, so that they can plan effectively and not be in the middle of a project and find the rules changing. One more thought on energy. Uh, you and a number of legislators recently filed for intervener status on this Berkshire gas moratorium issue. And there's a hearing coming up. Uh, as you're watching this, it may have already happened. Uh, why do you need intervener status? What does that do for you? It brings us to a higher level of access to the process. We can speak out any time, as any resident of the Commonwealth can. But when you have intervener status, you have a higher level of contact and engagement in the process than you can have. For example, getting more information, uh, forcing uh, questions to be answered as opposed to just asking them as though they were rhetorical questions. So by, by being an intervener, you can get access to certain records that a regular person can't get. Right? Certain, I think in that nature, yeah. I'm not an expert on that, but I think that's right. But how does that influence the process? I mean, this, have, being an intervener doesn't mean more gas suddenly appears in the, in the pipeline. Or this in, is about representing our constituents, okay. both the individuals and the businesses and institutions in our districts. 
So we're putting ourselves, we're creating a situation where we have a seat at the table as opposed to just being invited into the hall. What I can't understand is how do you, how does a company that's put a moratorium in place because they don't have access to enough gas, now, let's face it, they put all their eggs in one basket with this pipeline. How, how do you cre suddenly create new capacity? I mean, are there ways to do that? There are other solutions and had, let's assume Ned never happened and that was never proposed, they would have been much further along in planning how they were going to uh, provide gas. So for example, we have massive uh, uh, gas leaks. Pipes are leaking all over the place. They could be more aggressive there. Energy efficiency programs, so we use less in our homes and our businesses. Um, there's, uh, they are licensed to be able to do more LNG out of Waitley than they're doing now. They might have been much further along in deciding to do it and actually constructing it. Uh, they might have uh, pursued lateral connections with existing pipelines rather than the creation of a new pipeline coming across uh, virgin territory uh, such as Ned was gonna do. So once they got focused on Ned, there was, that everything else was put on the, right. on the, on the uh, side. Once Ned was dead, they went through their grieving process and we had conversations with them and they were in denial. How could this have been, how could this have happened? How could this have been turned down? But they, that didn't last long because they realized they have a responsibility to their customer base and, uh, and they, want to be a good, uh, they want to be a good company serving their customers. And so they got over their grieving pretty fast and started working constructively with us to find options. Let me ask you a hypothetical. Let's, so let's say Berkshire Gas says, okay, we realize we messed up. We put all, our, you know, all of our hopes on this pipeline, pipe dream. And so we, now we have a plan to do all the things you just listed. And they come to you and they say, Senator Rosenberg, Governor Baker, Speaker DeLeo, we can do all this, but it costs a ton of money. Would Beacon Hill be willing to help foot some of that bill? So uh, the way our energy system is structured, um, the, these costs are associated with the rates that people pay. And so they would come to the DPU, not to the state government and say, give us a handout. Because in fact, um, the Supreme Judicial Court just validated the position that the Senate took on a 39 to zero roll call vote and that 90 state representatives under the leadership of Steve Kulik signed a letter saying that there should be no separate tariff to pay for um, pipelines or any other infrastructure. There is a tried and true way of paying for that within the system and you should stick with that. And the risk should be borne by the company, not the consumers. And there's no reason to up, turn upside down the system and uh, come up with this new way of doing it. The governor was disappointed, the utilities are disappointed, but um, the Senate has voted. Um, you could not pass it in the House right now. So I think they all have to focus on how to use the existing system uh, the way they've been using it for decades. And that SJC ruling effectively blunts the possibility of them coming to the state saying, help us out. With Correct. People can try, but we're going to say no. You're going to say no, and, and the SJC already said no. So you kind of have that in, in your in your in your cabinet. in your back pocket. Exactly. Let's talk about the legislative session. A lot got done. Some stuff didn't get done, but you guys really got a lot of stuff done. Much more so than your counterparts in Washington, who oh, went on vacation please, without no doing. comparison. <laughs> but we um, have bipartisan cooperation in yeah. Massachusetts. Is part of the root of that. Very small minority in both the House and the Senate, very few Republicans in both branches. But the relationship between the Democrats and the Republicans, we actually listen to each other, we talk to each other, we find ideas, good ideas in both camps. They may not be adopted right away, but eventually they, we, they come together. So we find common ground on which to build good solutions. And we had a fantastic legislative term, and especially for low and moderate income people, which we've been talking, you know, the rhetoric has been, you know, up the kazoo for years about the middle income people. And if you look at what we got done this year, um, this term, it's pretty remarkable um, from pay equity to um, uh, public records reform, uh, earned income tax credit increase. For yeah, that was one you were big on. Yeah, yeah 415,000 families, they go to work every day. They just don't earn enough to be able to support their family. Between the minimum wage increase in January and the earned income tax credit, those 415,000 families got on average a $2,400 increase 
in revenue for their budgets. And these are people who make between fourteen and twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Amazing. That is a huge improvement for those people. And all of that money goes into the economy because they don't have the ability to put it in the bank or to buy stocks or whatever. So it's going right back into the economy. It helps our small businesses. It helps our communities. So we have to do uh, more of that. And as you say, there was a big rush to the finish line with six important pieces of legislation, five of which got to the governor's desk. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the economic development one you talked about, the transgender rights was another one. But, yeah. I, but I know what you mean about the bipartisan part. And I think that for me, the, the best example of that came at veto time, when yes. the governor went through and did a bunch of vetoes, even though you sent him a balanced budget, he decides to veto, you know, the DA's funding for his anti-crime unit yeah. and, the, and the task force. Opioid task, task force. force, yep. But, you know, that was, especially on the House side, I think, you know, between Susanna Whipsley and Paul Mark and Steve Kulik, they really work together. And, and you don't often see that kind of bipartisan yep. sort of working relationship. Um, and I think that that's something that, you could, should be lauded for. Not many, so every, not many pundits talked about that. Every but. override begins in the House. So the fact that they worked together meant that all of the things we cared about locally got taken care of. On the Senate side, um, there are fewer senators because there's only 40 in total. Right. Uh, but once those got over there, um, every one of them got override, overridden in the, uh, in the Senate as well. And um, we think the governor just went too far. Uh, do... Do we have some fiscal challenges? Absolutely. We cut $450 million out of the budget, balanced budgets that were appro approved by the governor, the House, and the Senate before we got into conference committee. And then the governor got a call from Department of Revenue and said, hey, the revenues have softened. And we got together and agreed on a $750 million gap, $450 million of which was dealt with by cutting spending. And that's not often what you see. What you see is there's a lot of times what you hear is let's we got to raise taxes. We need more revenue. Let's raise taxes. And that wasn't going to happen. You that, knew that. The House and the governor said no new revenue. And you guys were in agreement on a lot of those, well, except for the vetoes. Obviously, you overrode a lot of those. And a lot of them were bipartisan overrides. Yeah. I mean, if you looked at the number of yeah. times uh, Republicans joined the Democrats in those overrides, in, in spite of the fiscal challenges, and we know we're not out of the woods, and, and there'll be more to deal with in the coming months. But we think we're in relatively good shape for the moment because uh, the revenue figures even for July came in above benchmark. Not much, but above benchmark. Which is a good sign moving forward. As Correct. long as there isn't an Correct. economic crash and there's no yeah. reason to think that there will be. Moving forward, obviously now that you're in, you're not in session anymore, regular session. Formal session. Formal session. Yeah. The formal, next formal session begins in January. So now it's on to the fall and the election. And, and I know you've been very outspoken. You're not a big fan of the ballot question process. No, I'm not. And there were a couple of really big ones this yeah. year. The, the, one of which you've been very vocal on recently, and that is the legalized marijuana issue. And it's yeah. interesting because you and Dave Sullivan and others were, were supportive of decriminalization, mm -hmm. supportive of medical use, but you're not supportive of the idea of recreational use. Why? I'm not supportive of the ballot question. I believe adults should be able to make this decision. And so uh, it, I'm not objecting to the policy issue here. I'm objecting to the ballot question because we sent a team of eight senators out to Colorado to see how it's playing out there where it was legalized on the ballot a couple of years ago. They also had contact with people from Washington state where it was legalized. There are a series of policy questions that are completely unaddressed in the ballot question. And there are, some ballot, there are some issues in the ballot question which are, um, let's just say, a good faith effort was made, but they didn't necessarily get all the detail right. And my concern is that when you do a ballot question, if it passes, the perception is it's the people's law and you shouldn't touch it. Correct. So I tried to convince the governor and the speaker to put a question on the ballot that didn't have pages and pages and pages of new statute. It was a simple question should we legalize recreational marijuana so in Massachusetts so that the people could vote yes or no? And if they voted yes, we could go and do it and do it well through the legislative process. So um, that's my objection is the, the bill, as good faith effort as was made, is inadequate to really properly regulate and manage and support the efforts that are going to be necessary if it is 
legalized. Well, you've been here before because there have been other ballot questions. In fact, the medical marijuana question, it took, what, two or three years to make that to implement a, it. To, to make it workable yeah. right. because it was so flawed, the language that was passed. Correct. And the legislature did not go back in and correct it. The executive, the administration, had to make the changes through regulation, and that took a long time to get done, and then it took a long time to actually implement it. So I think it was something like three years before the first one actually opened, even though the law said that people should have access to it within a matter of months. Yeah. That is, uh, access to legal, have, have legal access to, rec, uh, to um, medical marijuana within something like three or six months. Yeah. I can't remember the amount, exact time, but it, was, it took three years to get the first one open, legally operating. I keep going back to the irony because, you know, here we are in a, in a time when we're trying to keep kids away from heroin with, a, you know, a stick in, in a, a chair, whatever we can find. And yet we're having a conversation about legalizing what still a lot of scientists believe is a gateway drug to some of those things. Many people believe that, um, and there have been some studies, but it is still a matter of uh, mostly speculation. That said, we can't, it's there. It's, it's on the ballot, and as voters, we have to do our homework and make our decisions. Another thing that's on the ballot is this idea of removing the cap on charter schools. Now, I think not enough has been said about the effort the Senate made to try and pass a bill or, or develop a bill that would have answered a lot of the questions. I mean, it's real easy to just remove the cap and say, you know, open the floodgates, but you really tried to develop, build some reforms that would have made that ballot question largely unnecessary, and it went nowhere. It got, you know, it landed with a big thud, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, why? Uh, the House of Representatives chose not to take it up. The, the short history of this was that uh, Almost three years ago, the Senate voted down an increase in the cap on the number of charter schools uh, that the House had passed. And so it was dead that term. People thought we should take it up in the legislature, rightly so, rather than on the ballot. The Senate took a deep, deep dive, but we started with only nine votes from the last term. 12 votes for the Senate bill, nine for the House bill, so you could say 12 votes. Two of those guys left the legislature, so now you're down to 10 votes, and you have to get to 21. It took six months of very hard work to, come, to put together a bill that would get 21 votes. I went to the floor leading a debate with only, uh, that morning we had 13 votes. And we threw everything but the kitchen sink in there. We had an eight-hour debate, and by the end of the eight hours, we had to throw the kitchen sink in wow. to get to 23 votes. So there's just a lot of concern in the Senate in particular. And if you look at what's happened historically, charter schools are 20 years old in Massachusetts. On average, five a year have been approved on average. Four have survived. So that's pretty good odds, 80% success rate. But now the ballot question calls for up to 12 a year, not the average of five we've been doing, up to 12 a year. That's a huge jump. And even many people who support charter schools have said, whoa, that's, that's too fast, too huge. In any event, it's, uh, again, something the voters will have to consider. And this is going to be quite a war uh, on, the, uh, on the ground. And in our region, uh, most people don't view the charters have been helpful. Well, that's the thing. And, and you know, regular red districts are terrified because, mm -hmm. you know, they're already getting siphoned off a know, lot of money, a lot of money. And, yeah. you know, and students and students. And, you know, the choice issue, that's not going to go away. But charter is a whole different animal because you're basically right. funding private schools with public money. That's the perception. Right. And when you can pick and choose which students you take and public schools can't do that, you know, you're yeah. taking money out of a system that has to educate all the leftover kids that can't get into a charter school, and, and there's not enough money now. And as you pointed out, they haven't been, we haven't reformed any of the policies around it for the 20 years, which is what the Senate tried to do so that it would be a more level playing field. And the rules that apply to public schools, more of them would apply to charters, and um, the charters would be uh, required to fulfill more of the obligations that right. the publics have to do. And one of the so it works pretty well in gateway communities sure. and in large, uh, uh, large complex urban settings. It doesn't work in, in rural and suburban communities. But isn't the larger issue the foundation budget, which is kind of arcane? It's a huge 
part of it. We haven't adjusted it for about 15 years. When we did ed reform in the early 90s, we made a seven-year commitment to increase pretty dramatically funding over a seven-year period. We kept that commitment, about a billion to billion three new state money, plus, plus school building assistance on top of that. And, um, but then after those seven years, all the law said was both the communities and the state have to keep up with inflationary cost, yeah. which we've pretty well done most years on both sides. But you cannot, in an environment where things like health care and pensions and other things are going up at a rate faster than inflation, you cannot keep up with that. So um, we need an infusion of new resources. And that was the focus of the Foundation Review Commission to try to figure out where are we on education finance in Massachusetts. They came back with findings that said there are three or four major cost centers. And if we could address the costs in those centers, it would put public school funding back on the right track. That's about a billion four over 10 years. We built it into the Senate's RISE Act. All right, well, so you, you have taken a step in that direction. The Senate did, it didn't pass, wow. but now we have a bill that we could start the conversation could pitch next year. Yeah. After the ballot question is resolved, one way or the other, we need to have this conversation about how are we gonna pay for the next generation of public education in Massachusetts. A couple minutes left, I wanna get your thoughts on re-election. You do have a challenger, I've never heard of him. He's from South Hadley. Who? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, obviously, you're, it, it would take a lot to knock you off uh, the, the top of the heap. And, and now, as Senate President and going into your, is this your second uh, year? Uh, I, I'm in my second year. In January, uh, I will stand for re-election as Senate President yeah. to start my second term if successful. You've been on, on the, the playing field for a long time. Do you still get the same rush from, yes. from what you do? When you can help even one family or one business or one community like we did just yesterday, getting $200,000 into Orange for a new parking lot yeah, to that. expand the Orange Innovation Center. It just, you know, you know why you're doing it with all the frustrations that come along with it. It makes it worth it. And then occasionally you get to do these big policy pieces. Well, where I sit now, and, and so that gives you an even bigger rush, and I've had those days or weeks in my career. But when you sit in the office of either the Senate President or the Speaker or the Ways and Means Chair's offices, your ability to do more just dramatically increases. So the fact that we were able to do you know, 80, more than 80 policy bills in the Senate, uh, not all of them got to the governor's desk, but many, many had been languishing for years, and we got at least a dozen to 15 substantial huge policy changes in the Commonwealth by virtue of the legislation that got to the governor's desk that really fundamentally change people's lives and the Commonwealth, you know that it's worth getting up in the morning. Well, as a longtime resident and native of Franklin County, thank you for the Gil Montague Bridge. Uh, you're which welcome. Which you cut the ribbon on <laughs> this week. Thank God that bridge it took six years and took 48 million bucks, years. but you oh. got it done. The first phone call I made was just to get it painted. <laughs> yeah. 20 years right. later, we had the cer ceremony celebrating its official reopening. <laughs> Stan Rosenberg is the president of the Massachusetts Senate. He is also your state senator. Thanks for coming, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. And we'll talk to you probably when the new session gets underway again, and good luck in the elections. And Thank we, you very much. We'll and follow the ballot. Have a great rest of the summer, everybody. And don't forget, hydrate <laughs> and conserve water, please. After that, I got another mixed message. <laughs> yeah. Senate President Stan Rosenberg is my guest. That's Speaking Hill Update. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.